Hello, hello, good morning, good morning, good morning. If you guys could uh, find your seat, please, say hi to someone on the way to your seat, and then I'll get going with announcements. I'll give you guys about 30 seconds or so, see how fast you are, see how, how much awake you are this morning. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and pray. If you could bow your heads, please. Thank you. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father. Oh, man, thank you for bringing us here. Uh, thank you for giving us the opportunity to have this awesome building, this awesome church with all these awesome people in it. We can come glorify you, bless you, or praise you, and, and, and just get, get a blessing from you. I, I bless the worship service. I bless the sermon. And I bless the fun we're going to have at the picnic. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. All right, so speaking of the picnic, the picnic is today. Um, I've been going to this for 30 years. <laughs> um, if you don't know where it's at, it's super easy to find. You go out on, on Route 11 and 15, make a right, go down to Papa John's, make a right, and then you'll turn on Ballfield Road, make a right. That's three rights near there. Make a right, Papa John's, make a right, right on Ballfield Road. Uh, VBS is coming up. That is closing in fast. It's just a few weeks today, uh, a few weeks away. I'm going to go through a few things, but if you have any questions, please see Linda Hunt or Mandy Melanja. Okay, so VBS is July 20th through the 24th. That starts at 6 p.m. and it goes to 8:30 p.m. Uh, there'll be a light meal provided at 5:30 p.m. The sign-up sheet. Um, for registration is out in the foyer. If you do have kids that want to sign up or friends uh, that have kids, please sign up so they get a good idea of, of uh, how many people are going to be attending, how many kids are going to be attending. Um, there's also a sign-up sheet for, for snacks plus meals, and, and there's, a lot of, uh, there's a lot of lines on that sign-up sheet. So if we could all pitch in to help, that would be awesome. VBS is a huge outreach. I remember going to VBS in this church way back when. Uh, my, my, uh, my brother and my sisters, a lot of friends. I know that uh, people that were brought to VBS that are now in full-time ministry as adults pastoring churches that are, you know, really thriving, and it all started with VBS. It's really cool. I'm sure you guys all have heard stories or have stories of your own about the impact of VBS. Um, and it's just really awesome. So we need to pull together and, and, and help there with the meals, with the sign-up sheets. Um, we also need crew leaders. Um, a, a crew leader will be responsible for about five kids or so. Um, there's little VBS stations, and you, you, you take the kids from station to station um, each night, and it's really easy, it's really fun. And, and Mandy and Linda are really good with helping with uh, learning and, 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 and what you need to do to be able to be a crew leader. So if you want to be a crew leader, please sign up for that, too. They need those as well. And there will also be a crew leader meeting next Sunday after church. It will be like less than 30 minutes just to go over what's, what's going to happen the week of VBS. And they also need a few things. They need a large sheets of cardboard. So if you have any or you know of anyone that has some that are, you know, they want to get rid of them, please see Mandy or Linda and uh, please, please bring those because that'd be great. Um, any questions, see Linda or Mandy. One last thing, ladies, there is a ladies brunch coming up that is Saturday, July 11th at 10.30 a.m. That's here at the church. Please try to attend, and please bring a dish. All right, thanks, guys. Good morning. Can everybody stand? Uh, do come to VBS. I remember David being in VBS. And he was praying over snack at that time. Uh, he probably doesn't remember that. 30 years ago. Oh, boy, I'm old. 
Okay. Join me in Matthew 28. Therefore, go and make disciples in all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And then teach the new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, that I am with you always, always, until the end of the world. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. Praise God for his word. Can you say amen? amen. I want you to know today is a time of liberty because of the spirit of God is a spirit of liberty. In fact, one of the scriptures that this particular church is founded on is found in chapter three of 2 Corinthians, verse 17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Freedom. Freedom or liberty or emancipation. We can think of all those words, right? I believe the way it could be translated, and I believe this is really what is meant there is where the spirit is Lord, there is liberty. And today, as we have gathered and assembled together, we want to come under the Lordship of the Holy Spirit, who always points us to Jesus. And so today, we want to open our hearts to him, let him have his way. And as we do, something awesome and powerful will happen in your life. You're going to be touched by God today, I believe, with all of my heart. And how many know that that liberty or freedom he gives you and he gives me, we've got to make sure that we maintain it. We don't want to go back into anything else. Another yoke of bondage, do we? But we want to be free. And Jesus has come to set us free. Amen. We're going to invite the precious spirit of God right now together as we look to him. Dear spirit of God, Dear spirit of God. we know you're here. You came with us. You're inside of us. You're called alongside of us. Come now with manifestation. Manifest yourself. <laughs> Manifest yourself in our midst. Touch our lives. Help us, O oh Lord, to enter into worship with appreciation for you love for you we need help Holy Spirit we welcome you oh we welcome you we welcome you we welcome you we welcome you hallelujah hallelujah oh we praise you right now glory to your precious name Jesus you are the Lord of all. Hallelujah. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. We love you, Jesus. We magnify you. Glory to your name. Glory. Thank you, Papa God. Thank you, Papa God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Perfect. 
he's never found Oh, well, the father's in the room Come on, sing Phil Failure's never found Oh, well, the father's in the room on the move when the father's in the room praise the Lord swing wide and the dead come to life love is on the move when the father's in the room miracles take place and the cynical find faith love is breaking through when the father's in the room Jericho walls are breaking and strongholds now are shaking. Love is breaking through. We are the fathers in the room. Causing that now. Love is breaking through. We are the fathers in the room. Lay your burdens down.
Lord, praise you for your forgiveness, God. Sit on you, and you meet me here today with the mercies that are new. All my fears and doubts, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I'm here with you. It's a new horizon, and I'm sitting. fears and doubts they can all come to because they can stay alone when I'm here with you it's a new horizon and I'm set on you you made me here today with mercies that I knew all my fears and doubts they can all
You're the one true way. Can we just praise him right now together, church? Just this whole group together. Let's just lift our hands and just love on him. God, we just love you. Lord, we praise you. We thank you, God, that you have us in the palm of your hand today. Oh, we just want to bless your heart, Lord. We just bless you, God. We bless you. We love you. We thank you. Praise you, praise you, praise you. Praise you. Isn't he good? Come on, God is good. Yes, yes, God, you are so good. And isn't he just totally, totally full of love, you know? Sometimes it's hard for us. We're humans. We don't always have the love that we're supposed to have. We, uh, we're supposed to have that love of God that just flows from us. And it's hard to do that. But, but it just always happens with him. He, it doesn't end with him. He is full of love. And you know, he wants what's best for you and for me. He wants to see us prosper, amen? He says there's no room for poverty for his children. There's no room for bitterness and, and depression and despair. If you have any of those things going on in your life, I just want to encourage you right now. He's got something better than better for you. He's got something better than that. He has plans for you, not to hurt you or harm you, but to prosper you. So we just need to speak into our future right now. There are going to be better days ahead. It's going to be better there, better there. Better than I could dream. It's gonna be better there, better there, better than I could dream. It's gonna be better there, better there, better than I could dream. It's gonna be better there, better there, better than I could dream.
declare that come on now. I prophesy into tomorrow we will see the goodness of our God it's gonna be better than better than better than I could dream it's gonna be better than better than better than I could dream come on declare gonna be better than that you have us in the palm of your hand each and every day and you have not forgotten you've not forgotten us you've not forgotten the promises the promises you've made you've not forgotten the dreams you've put in our hearts controls the world I see 
that walks me through it all.
God. There's where our focus should be is on the Lord. Can you say amen? Not what he can do for us only, but rather <laughs> we start with our focus on him as a person. We do have some people that have something to share. So this week when I was just talking to God about everything that was going on and he took me back to when I was four and I took Taekwondo and he reminded me how much I didn't know what I was doing when I arrived. <laughs> I didn't know my strength. I really didn't know anything this body could do. And uh, But there were these awesome guys doing like roundhouses and all this amazing stuff, breaking boards and anyway. So uh, why he took me there, he was like, this is school, Nat. This is school. All this stuff you see, it's school. It's actually my mercy preparing you for another time. He said, in this chaos, I'm teaching you how to discern my voice, how to find me in complete chaos. See, it's a sharpening. It's actually mercy. I was just blown away how much this is God's mercy and, and it's his school. And so I didn't start off in karate doing roundhouses and breaking boards the same way. Even in the kingdom, I had every spiritual thing given to me, but I didn't know what to do with it. And But I have this awesome teacher named Holy Spirit. And he's teaching us. And don't miss out on the pain. Because I went through two years of great pain. And man, is it a distraction. <laughs> right? We're miserable, whiny sheep. And the Lord's teaching us to be strong and triumphant in this time. Because the, we shouldn't look like the people who don't have him. Right? No. We shouldn't be the complainers like everyone else. Right? We have a living hope. A living hope. See, he's alive in us. He's, he didn't fall off the throne this week because the Democratic Party rose up or the demons woke up this morning. No. He didn't fall off the throne when health conditions or children or sisters are into drugs. And No, he didn't fall off the throne. And he told me this morning he's breaking off the spirit of discouragement off people's lives that's been hanging on for far too long. There is a living hope. He is full of life, and in him there is no lack. He lacks nothing. That's our God. Mountains, they, they bow before him. Demons tremble when we wake up. Oh, it's in me this morning, the power of God. It's in us, every one of you this morning. Oh, hallelujah, wake up. Stir those things that were put within you. The world needs them. They need us. They need us. Oh, they need hope. At my job, they need hope. Every day they meet me. They meet me at the door wanting to tell me all the news. My husband wants to wake me up in the morning let me know all the news. And you know what I tell him? The news of heaven. The end, we win. We win. It's already settled. We win. God's mercy is so good. Um, I, I've been wanting to share this message for well, several months now. Uh, but what happened this past week has really spoken to me and opened my eyes. And I, I just feel that God's called me to share with you guys. Um, first of all, um, this may be a longer message. I don't want to ramble on or anything like that. But at any rate... Um, <clears throat> it's just been incredible. <sighs> but anyway, for those of you who don't know me, I own my own tree service. And two years ago, we had an amazing year, you know, one of the best years we ever had. And then the following year, it was just like the wind was taken out from under my sails and my knees were knocked out from under me. and. And uh, I, I questioned God. I was like, man, what's going on? I didn't know what was happening, and I, I got mad. I, I started to curse God, and I started to get angry. And 
I started to question. I was like, what is going on? I just don't know what you're doing. And I thought you were supposed to take care of me. You know, my life was falling apart. And it was just stressful thing after stressful thing, moment after moment was going by. And it was just getting harder before it was getting better. Anyway, <clears throat> and this year came along. I laid awake one night and um, I couldn't get to sleep. And then the Lord spoke to me and says, hey, um, I want you to start a nonprofit and um, I want you to go ahead and um, teach prisoners through the work that you do a skill so that when they get out of prison that they'll have something that they can build, rebuild their lives on and stuff. And I thought that was wonderful and stuff and I looked into it for a little bit and but I, I just told the Lord, you know what, it's in your timing, you know. Anyway, uh, a, little, a few months went on and we started getting busier and busier and busier. And now this has been the busiest year we've ever had. And it's been great, but it's been super, super, super stressful. Just dealing with employees, <laughs> um, dealing with all the headaches of trying to make sure things go well and so on and so forth. And then all of a sudden, Thursday came by and the Lord just spoke to me and it just opened my eyes. And uh, the Lord said, you know what? The reason why you're going through all this stuff is because I'm bringing you broken people. Broken people. And I'm trusting you with a few things right now. So in the future, then I can bless you with many things later on, you know. And um, anyway, I don't know who needs to, to hear this, but back then I, I was real selfish, you know. I was super selfish. And um, we need to get out of ourselves. We need to get out of the way. We need to let Jesus just take over. And we need to just let him do his, his work. When we were worshiping and I came up to the front and I really just sensed that there was a breaking anointing that just began. There's many of God's people in a place of that need, they need breakthrough. And God said, you don't need to war in worship and dance here on Sundays. Build an altar in my presence and seek me and I will give you strategy for the things that you're facing because when we try to fix things in and of ourselves, it becomes more painful. But when we give it to the Lord and he begins to release that anointing, it's what breaks the yoke. And it was here in part, but he's releasing it in greater part as we press in and surrender in worship and dance. Praise God. Amen. God's good. Can you say amen? All right. We do have offering plates out. We do not have any uh, ushers to take up the offering. We're still doing it this particular way. Let me just say this, that we normally have communion on the first Sunday of the month, but when we have a picnic, because we have a number of people that are over on the picnic grounds preparing everything, they wouldn't be able to take communion, so we put it off for one Sunday. So next Sunday we'll be celebrating Holy Communion. Praise God. God's so good. Can you say amen? All right. We got some prayer concerns. I'm going to ask someone to stand up, not I'm going to lead in prayer, but I want you to stand up that you're definitely going to zero in on this prayer request. Leah is nearly healed. She needs 
complete healing, someone will stand up and pray for her. Not out loud, but I mean, as I lead in prayer, you'll stand up. Someone, please. Okay, Bernard, he had problem with his feet. They were so swollen, he couldn't get his shoes on. Someone stand up for Bernard, okay. Uh, Ernie Sherritt, someone stand up for Ernie. Okay, uh, Linda Sullivan, she's going to begin radiation this Monday. All right, I see that hand. Doug Stetler, someone stand up for him. Okay, Margie, good. Summer's been really ill as far as stomach uh, problems, virus or whatever, so will you pray for her? I see a hand back there. All right, BBS, someone stand up that this is going to be the prayer request that you're going to zero in on. BBS. All right, and then our nation. All of you stand up for our nation. We need to pray for our nation. All right. Agree with me and make sure you lift that one need up that you have committed to. Amen. So that every need is covered for the glory of God. Amen. Dear Father, we thank you for every time you have intervened on our behalf. We thank you as we look over the years that we have known you. How many times you have come on the scene to minister to us, to bring us through a very difficult place, a difficult circumstance. You've never, never failed. We want to praise you and thank you for that. Hallelujah. We're thankful that you're our Papa God and that you really love us and that we're your children. We're your sons and your daughters. And even now, today, you look down upon us. We have your full attention and we thank you for that. Hallelujah. And we just ask that you heal today, not only Leah, but you heal Michelle Melocrino's father, that you will minister to her daughter, who is now in a rehab place. Lord, just undertake. Heal Bernard, heal Ernie, heal Linda, heal Doug and Summer. And Father, we just ask that you would just move in a mighty way with BBS this year. Bless every worker, every person. Every uh, area that needs help, every position that needs to be filled, I ask that you do it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now our nation, Lord, we just say to you, help our nation. May there be another great awakening. We give you praise in the name of Jesus, and we thank you for it. We ask, Lord, may we have our part by reviving us, Lord, do that so that we can be on the cutting edge to touch the lives of many in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Praise God. This morning we're going to be going over, well, it'll be afternoon, but shortly after uh, noon we'll be going over for our picnic. If you're here today and you didn't know we were having a church picnic, don't feel you got to go out and buy something and bring it over. You're welcome. Please come, and I believe you enjoy yourselves. At this time, I want you to stand, if you would, because we're going to look up here at the first slide. And the title of it is Healing of Shame that binds you, the healing of shame that binds you. Hebrews 12, 2, I'm going to read in your hearing now. Later, I will read Matthew 27, verses uh, 28 through 31. Notice, if you will, and listen carefully to Hebrews 12, 2. Looking unto Jesus, that's a good word. Can you say amen? Why? Because he's the author and finisher of your faith and my faith. Who, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Let's ask God's blessing, and we'll fellowship around his word and the message this morning. Father, help us now. We're in the school of the Holy Spirit. Teach us, teach us, heal through us. Heal us in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. You may be seated. I begin by saying I'm glad that I'm an American. I do celebrate the birthday of our country, which was yesterday. This whole weekend, we are celebrating the fact that our nation became free. We thank God for what he has done in preserving this nation, 
You know, they tell us that with democracy, they only last from 200 to 250 years. I want you to know we have just celebrated yesterday 244 years. Why do they not last longer? Because people become indifferent. They forget the cost of having a democracy. They forget the history that's involved with our nation developing and evolving as it has. And so after a while, no one wants to really defend it anymore. All they want to do is change it into whatever they want it to be. I just want you to know that there is a spirit of anarchy out there that really today really bothers me a whole lot. But you know, a nation is made up of people. And when we think about people, I'm part of that. So what can I do to see change take place? But that's not really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about another nation. Peter talks about how that the body of Christ is a nation. In fact, he calls it a holy nation in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Another translation calls it a spiritual nation. Can I tell you that Jesus came to set us free and the people of this nation really have experienced him as savior or they wouldn't be part of that nation. But I'm here to tell you, just like in our country here in the USA, people still are not free, are they? They really aren't. Can I tell you that in the nation that is a holy nation or spiritual nation, which is the body of Christ, so many of God's people are not free. I'm a counselor. I've been a pastor for years. Let me tell you what I have learned. So many of God's people within the body of Christ really are not free. There's areas of their life, lives where they are bound and they need to be set free. In fact, when the Lord put this church on my heart in order for it to be planted, one of the things he wanted was, first of all, to have us look at it as a, a spiritual hospital because there were so many hurt people, so many people who needed their damaged emotions healed by the power of God. And then the other aspect was an armory where after they were healed, they could get equipped. They could be able to discover what their, their gift is or their gift mix is so that they could go to the battlefield and be used of God to help others. This message this morning may not apply to you, but I want you to know there's people that will watch this service. And when they watch it on Facebook or some other way, I'm here to tell you that there's going to be people that are touched. If it doesn't really minister to you, then maybe you could understand how you could be a person that could bring about change in a person's life by helping them to understand how that they can really get healed of the shame that binds them. When I think about shame this morning, I want, you to, I want to give you a brief definition of it. Like all definitions, they never say the whole story. But look up here, if you will, on the screen, please, and notice. Shame is a painful feeling. That's a mix of regret, self-hate, and dishonor. Feeling shame or ashamed is one of the most miserable feelings a person can have. Can I tell you something? Alcohol, drugs will never drown it out because when you're sober, when you're not high, you're going to still feel that, that shame down deep within. In the book, Letting Go of Shame, Ronald Potter, Ephraim, and Patricia Potter, Ephraim, they list some examples of shame. One of those examples, and I'll give you the list they have, would be, I am defective. Another one, another one is, I am dirty. Another one is, I'm incompetent. Another one is, I'm unwanted. Let's enlarge on that one just for a moment. Unwanted, unloved, unappreciated, uncherished. How many times do we feel those kinds of emotions and those kinds of feelings? I am weak. I am bad. I am pitiful. I am nothing. Let's think about that one for a moment because some people really feel worthless. They feel invisible. They feel unnoticed. They feel empty. Now, I know that some of you actually feel some of this, but uh, can I tell you something? Sometimes we're so sophisticated, we hide all of these things. How many understand that? We really do. And sometimes we don't feel it's a safe place to really share how we really feel. But I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ wants to heal you today. He wants to set you free from shame. 
Let me tell you about shame. It develops as a slow, relentless accumulation of such thoughts. One thought, insult at a time, delivered to ourselves over weeks, months, and years. And we have people to come along and help with that. How many know that? People that have been really uh, individuals that have been negative about us and try to tear us down and insult us. Notice that each of the previous statements starts with, I am. And when you think about that, this reinforces our definition of shame as a state of being that goes far beyond anything we do or fail to do. I'm here to tell you that because of shame, we need someone to help us. We need someone that is greater than a psychiatrist, greater than a psychologist. They can help to a degree, but they're not the answer because they cannot heal us of the shame. They cannot take that out of our hearts and out of our lives. And I'm here to tell you today, there's someone that can do that. And you say, well, I already know that. Well, I, I want you to get beyond what you know, and I want you to grab hold of the truth of God. I want you to open up to the Spirit of God so he can do something radical down deep in your heart, that he can perform uh, spiritual surgery, because that's important. Could you say amen to that? That person is none other than Jesus Christ himself. In a moment, I'll have Lillian put up some scripture, but before we get to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, let me just share with you verse 14. It tells us this. We have a great high priest that has passed through the heavens. He's gone through the atmospheric heaven, the starry heaven, into the abode of God, which is the third heaven. Can I tell you, even though he has passed from this earth up there, and he's our high priest right now, he's closer to you than I am. He's closer than any psychiatrist, psychologist, any of the fivefold ministry. Jesus Christ is closer to you right now. Now notice, if you will, verse 15 that follows verse 14. Notice what it says up here. This high priest of ours understands. Say the word understands. Our weaknesses. For he faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Let me read this same verse from the message, and we'll put it up there for you. It says, we don't have a priest who is out of touch with our reality. Did you hear that? He's not out of touch with your reality. Where you are today, thank God for that. So many times people who minister to us, they sometimes come with pat answers. Sometimes they give you book knowledge, but they can't really touch our lives like they should. I'm here to tell you that Jesus always deals with our reality. He touches us with reality. He's been through weakness and testing. He's experienced it all, all but the sin. When you think about that today, what I want to say to you is this. Jesus really understands the shame you're going through. And I want to prove that by scripture to show you how much shame that he went through. You say, I already know all that. Listen for the first time. You know, they used to advertise on TV a cereal that says, try them again for the first time. Try this truth today again for the first time, okay? And I want to take you back to the day in which Jesus Christ was taken and it was at night, and he was taken to Pilate's residence. There were, a there were hundreds of soldiers there at that place, okay? And I want you to know that that would mean anywhere from 300 to 600 soldiers were there at Pilate's residence when they brought Jesus in. How would you like to be taken to a party by force? And when I talk about a party, this party, by the way, is really a party of shame. It really is. And when you would be taken to a party by force and you're going to be the object of shame, how would that make you really, really feel? Well, Matthew 27, verse 28 says, And they stripped Jesus, and they put a scarlet robe on him. Notice, first the soldiers stripped him. I want you to know he's standing before all of these soldiers, standing there stark naked, I want you to know. And nakedness was viewed as a disgrace in that day. It was viewed as a shame. It was viewed as an embarrassment in the Jewish world. 
In fact, when you talked about public nakedness, it was associated with pagans, with their worship, with their idols, with their statues. As children of God, listen to this, the Israelites honored the human body. Why? Because God had created it. To publicly parade someone's naked body was a great offense in that particular day. And I want you to know, when Jesus stood there naked before all of those soldiers, it went against the grain of his entire moral view of what was right. Once Jesus stood naked before them, something followed. The soldiers then put a scarlet robe on him. This robe could refer to a soldier's cloak, but the previous word tells us something different because the word scarlet is used. It makes it more probable that it was an old cloak of Pilate. You see, the word scarlet is a word that describes a robe that has been dyed a deep scarlet color. And I want you to know, that is the kind of robe that someone who was noble or someone who was royal, so it would be robes worn by royalty and nobility. Did someone in the unit of these soldiers uh, one soldier, perhaps, who worked at Pilate's residence, did he pour an old royal robe from Pilate's closet and bring it to the courthouse for this party of shame? I think it's true. I think it seems to be true. Let me read further in Matthew 27 as we look at what Jesus went through and how he was shamed. It reads, beginning with verse 29, when they had twisted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head, a reed in his right hand. And they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. Then, he, then they spat on him. They took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they took the robe off him, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. When you think about these thorns, I want you to know they were everywhere, including in the imperial grounds of Pilate. These thorns were long and sharp like nails. And the soldiers took the vines of thorns and they carefully wove them into something that uh, looked like a crown, okay, a circle that resembled a crown. It was a kind of crown that these soldiers took and they violently pushed down upon Jesus' head. How many know that would really cause extreme pain? And I want you to know the blood flowed profusely from his brow. Because these thorns were so jagged, they could have created terrible wounds as they scraped across Jesus' skull and literally tore the flesh from his skull. I don't know about you, but after having stood naked and now I'm looking like this, and you've got to remember that this was not an easy thing for our Lord. I believe he was every much a man as any man could ever be. I believe he had to resist fighting but he knew he was there for one reason and that was to redeem mankind and no matter what it took he would take the shame upon himself then we find Matthew calls this a crown of thorns that word crown describes a coveted victor's crown or it could be the crown for an emperor what these soldiers are trying to do they want to put this crown of thorns on him after they already put this uh, cloak around him, okay, because they wanted to make fun of him. They wanted to mock him. They didn't know that Jesus was preparing to win the greatest victory in history. Can you say amen? And then after they forced the crown on his head, then he put a reed in his right hand. There were many beautiful ponds and fountains in Pilate's inner courtyard, and they would what would grow there would be long, tall, hard reeds. That word hard is very important. They weren't flimsy reeds. They were hard because they're going to beat him with those reed, with a reed, okay? Well, Jesus sat there, okay? Just think, visualize this. As he sat before them, he's clothed in this royal robe, crown of thorns on his head. One of the soldiers must have realized this picture isn't complete. So he pulled a reed from one of the pounds ponds or fountains to put in Jesus' hand. And this represented a ruler's staff. It really did. And I want you to know that in that particular day, when you think about even the coins of the emperor, it would picture him with a scepter or a staff in his right hand, okay? This is what they wanted to do. And so they minted these coins in honor of the emperor and sold it with this discarded royal robe. 
about his shoulders, a crown of thorns set deeply in his head. The blood drenched his face. And a reed, the soldiers bowed their knee before him and mocked him and saying, Hail, King of the Jews. My, oh, my. How would you like to go through that disgrace? How would you like to go through all of that? Okay. And when these, pilot, or these soldiers of Pilate uh, called out and said, Hail, King of the Jews, that word hail was a word that was always used in, in acknowledging the honor that they would give Caesar when they saluted him. But now they're just mocking Jesus, okay? And so we find that they really shouted out this mock salute because they again wanted to embarrass him. They wanted to mock him. And then they spit on him. Boy, I don't know about you. I wouldn't want anybody spitting in my face. Have you ever had that happen? You know how you felt. And then they struck him on the head. And that word they, I want you to know, it refers to the entire unit of the soldiers who were present there in Pilate's courtyard that night. So each soldier would pass by Jesus. They would first, in a mocking way, kneel before him, okay? Then they would lean forward and spit in his face. Then they would take the reed from his right hand and hit him over the head. Then they would put the reed back in his right hand, and the next soldier would come by. And that was repeated time and time again. And when you think about 300 soldiers to 600 soldiers, when they got done spitting on Jesus and striking him with a reed, I want you to know, that was something terrible. And believe me, this is what they wanted to do to mock Jesus. You know, Pilate accused him of wanting to be king. I'm here to tell you he is the king. Can you say amen? He's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. Let me tell you about these soldiers. Even though they... In a mocking way, they knelt before him and said, Hail. All right. Do you know that Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 tell us this. And the verses preceding that talk about when Jesus humbled himself and came from heaven to take upon him a, a human body and to really be like a servant, okay? How that after all of that, and he was crucified, Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 and 11, talk about where God has highly exalted him and given him a name above every name, and that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Isn't that neat when you really think about it? Well, I tell you what, they'll give an account for their actions if they didn't come to Jesus before they die. Then there's the shame of the cross, which I read about early on from Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2. And notice, it tells us how unpleasant this cross really was because Jesus despised it. I think that's very important because it reveals something to all of us. It reveals exactly what Jesus felt emotionally about his time spent on the cross. And according to this verse, he despised the whole experience. I want you to know that when you think about the cross, it was degrading, it was crushing, it was humiliating. In fact, when you think about crucifixion, it was the lowest, cruelest, and most barbaric form of death in the Roman Empire. Criminals were crucified. But he was willing to take your place and mine. Can you say amen? Jesus was hung on the cross naked. How would you like to hang on a cross naked? Looking the way he already looked, okay? And remember, when they took him away, he went to the whipping post first before they hung him on the cross, okay? So Hebrews 12, 2 goes on to say that Jesus despised the shame of this experience. And when you think about the word shame, it really depicts disgrace, embarrassment, or a human, excuse me, uh, of humiliation. I'll get that word out. I'm here to tell you today, when you and I come to Jesus, our high priest, he can feel what we feel. He can be touched by how we feel. Remember I told you he's closer to you than anyone. He loves you. He died for you. He went through all of this shame because he cared about you. Now think with me for a moment. Some of the shame that we experience way we were raised, I believe, 
that how we are shaped is so important. Some of us didn't have father and mothers that really nurtured us. They didn't really build us up. They only talked to us in negative terms. Some of them were abusive. Then we can understand some people have experienced rape and the shame of rape. Believe me, I know a little bit about that. I've never been raped, but my wife was raped. And I know what she went through, and I know how, what it felt like being a spouse of, 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 of someone who was raped. Then you could think about sexual sin. You could think about a lot of things. I'm here to tell you, whatever you're feeling today, and I'm here to say this to you, that if you have shame in your heart, even to a little degree, there's a reason for that. And Jesus this day wants you to put that on him. Can you say amen? We believe he bore our sins. We believe he bore our sicknesses. I believe he took our shame. Can you say amen? And because he took our shame, I believe that we need to put that shame on Jesus and then say, Jesus, heal me. And when he heals you, you will be free of it. Hallelujah. And then you begin to not only know who you are in Christ in your head, but you're going to start to walk in it. You're going to start to experience it. There's going to come a freedom inside of you because that healing will take place down deep inside. Over the years, I've talked to people who have for years had one little thing or big thing in their life that they never felt that they got through it. They felt like this thing haunted them. It would always appear again so often. I mean, when I say appear, it wasn't something you saw, but I mean, it would come back into their lives and their thought processes and so on. I'm here to tell you, God wants to really set you free. He really, really does. I'm asking you right now to think about this one verse, and we're going to put it up here if you look on the screen. It's Isaiah 61, 7, because it's a promise to you and to me today. It says, instead of their shame, my people will receive a double portion. And instead of disgrace, they will rejoice in their inheritance. That was one translation. Let me give you the other one that's up there, okay. Instead of shame and dishonor, what does it say now? Isn't that neat when you think about it? God does that for you and me. He really, really does. But the important thing is get it out of the closet where you feel that shame and let Jesus take care of it. Let him heal you of it as you place it on him and he, because he's already born it. You stand in the presence of God. Hallelujah. Now again, I told you things you already know, but what I wanted to get into your brain and your frontal lobe was this, what he actually went through. I wanted you to feel that. I wanted you to be like you were there. And because you were there in the moment by the Spirit of God, you could understand he understands the shame. He understands it right now. He really, really does. How many could lift your hand with eyes closed and say, God is speaking to my heart today. Would you put your hand up? Are there others? Can I tell you that religion causes shame? Some people have been raised in legalistic churches where everything was negative. They were put down if they did this or that. That's why we lost a whole lot of youth in the churches because of that. Yes, we're to hate sin, but we're to love the sinner. We're to hate sin, but we're to love the Christian. Can you say amen? I'm going to ask you to come forward. I know there's a picnic, but I, I believe you need to come. You need to put this shame on Jesus and ask him to heal you down deep inside. Amen. There's some others God's dealing with this morning. I know he is. God is so good. Boy, don't you love Jesus? 
Boy, he's a wonderful Savior, but he's a wonderful high priest. He really cares about us. I think there's some more here. Sometimes we say, I'll take care of it at home, Pastor. <laughs> I'm here to say to you today, God wants to touch your heart. He wants to touch your life in a special way. Praise God. Praise the Lord. They're all on one side of the altar here, but that doesn't matter, does it? Amen. Praise the Lord. God's good. Here comes a brother here. They have it. Praise God. Amen. Brian, good. Someone else that God's dealing with today. I'm going to ask that uh, pastors and elders come to pray. I'm going to ask that Stan, Bullard, come please and pray. I'm going to ask another guy here that needs to come. He's got a biblical name called David. He needs to come up here and pray for some people. Praise God, David. I'm, hallelujah. He's tired because they've been away on vacation, but I know God will give him strength the moment he lays his hand on somebody and prays for him. Hallelujah. Michelle is coming to help pray. Praise God. You know, I, I said to myself, Jerry, why would you preach on shame on 4th of July weekend? I said, I wouldn't choose to do that. God put it on my heart. And there's a reason for it. Because he wanted to minister to some people in this congregation. I ask you that will watch this Maybe you're watching it live or you'll watch it later. Right there where you are in your living room or wherever you are, I ask that you will come to Jesus right now. First of all, it always begins when you deal with shame of asking Jesus in your heart, in your life. But even when you do that, you need to further let him heal you from shame. Right where you are right now, I'm just believing that the Holy Spirit is touching your heart and ministering to you big time in Jesus' name. I would ask that if you've been touched by this message or any of the messages that are preached here by our pastors and outside speakers, that you would contact us. Let us know that you are being touched. And if you have prayer concerns, get on our email and, and we will pray for them. We definitely will. God bless you. Bless them, Father, wherever they are when they watch or hear this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus.